All right, Revelation chapter 1. Let's just start by reading verses 1 through 3, and then we'll do just a slight recap of a couple of things we touched on last time, and then move on digging through the chapter. So Revelation 1, 1 through 3, who will grab that for us? Elijah. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by the by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Okay, so revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, what did we mention the original meaning there is? Sometimes we, we mention this book is titled The Apocalypse. Making bear. Yeah, making bear. You know, today apocalypse people think of um, like disaster, war, uh, things like that. And yes, the, the book describes war, but... Really, the meaning of it is just unveiling, just a revealing of something. So this is the revelation or the unveiling of truth uh, through Jesus Christ, which God, as it says here, gave to show him uh, to John and things like that. Now, um, when it says here these things to shortly take place, that they must shortly take place, does that mean everything in the book? Okay, what did we discuss on that? Anybody remember? So the things to shortly take place, we understood it had primary application to the recipients, to the seven churches of Asia. So things that they would experience and go through, at least those things would begin to unfold at that time in their lifetimes. But remember we mentioned at the end of the book, it's sort of like a fast forward. It says here's the final outcome. And it gives us a glimpse of heaven and the things that we can look forward to in heaven. And that would give them encouragement as they were going through their difficulties and trials and tribulations. By the way, what were their trials and tribulations? What was going on? Severe persecution. Roman government basically made it a point to attack the Christianity movement. Okay, yeah. Roman, imperial, organized, direct persecution against Christians. And so as they're going through that suffering, part of what's going through their mind is you understand studying through this letter that they're wondering, is the cause of Christ going to survive? Is, is our cause that we've committed ourselves to worth sticking to it? Because things look very bleak. And the letter is to give them encouragement about, in the end, the Lord will be victorious. Don't get distracted. Don't get overwhelmed with what's going on here. Understand that this is something that the Lord is perfectly well aware of and is addressing. So, he says there in verse 1 that he signified it by his angel to his servant John. What's the idea of signified? Made known. There are things being made known through this signified. Signified. Yeah. Signs. But, yeah. Sign. So, so it's things that are not necessarily literal. They're representative of something. And so as we read through it, we read all these fantastic visions. But we need to understand we can't press a literal meaning into so many of these things that they're, they're representative of something else. And so we had just mentioned we're going to be cautious as we go through the letter. And we're not going to chase every detail and every rabbit trail as we go through here. Now, verse 3, question number 2, we're skipping question 1 for right now, but question number 2 is who is blessed in 1 verse 3? He who reads. 
He who reads it, he who hears it, and he who keeps it. Right? And that reading, some translations have something other than blesses he who reads. Does anybody have ESV maybe? What does that say? He who reads. He who reads? Yeah. Okay, I have a different ESV at home. <laughs> <laughs> he who reads aloud. He who reads aloud. That's, that's the meaning of this here. He who reads aloud. What does that tell you about this letter? Anything in just the, the basic nature of the New Testament, the letters that are written. It was to be shared. It was to be shared and it was to be broadcast among these congregations. I mean, each of the seven churches has to receive a copy of this. And the most efficient way to get that message out was to read it aloud. Now, there would be one copy made, two copies, three copies, four copies, a thousand copies, you know, all of that through time. But to get this message to them immediately, they're going to get it and read it aloud to everyone. Hey. We sometimes forget with our modern technology how communications were done thousands of years ago. Uh, <laughs> public letters like that would have been read aloud in an open form uh, mm -hmm. throughout you know, the little different locations. And if, if you go to the Middle East today, a lot of that is still done to this day, uh, you know, the elder of the local tribe in Afghanistan may read something from, you know, the Afghan government or the U.S. government saying key points. Right. They know them. Right, exactly. And it tells you also, we need to remember this is the method God chose to reveal His will. He did not reveal it individually to every member of the church. He revealed it to John. John recorded that. That was copied. Those copies of that letter sent to various places and then people read it. And the Lord saw fit that that was reliable to communicate His will to people. And so there is a great value in taking the Word of God and reading the Word of God and reading it aloud among people, among a group of those who are interested in knowing what God would have them to do to understand. So blessed is he who reads aloud. So the reader is blessed, right? The one who reads it's blessed. The one who hears it is blessed. There's a value of us listening to the Word of God. And then what's that last one? Keeps it. What does that mean? Okay, obedient. Be a doer of the word, not just to hear, right? So they need to receive this message. Um, they would be happy to receive this message because God is giving them that encouragement through this letter. Uh, probably when you read through some of these things, especially when we get to some of the specifics in chapters 2 and 3, there's probably some things that were hard to hear for some of those churches, whether that's the rebuke that's given to them or whether that's you're going to suffer. Probably some difficulties in hearing those things, but the overall message of victory, that the cause of Christ will be victorious in the end, that's something they would rejoice to be able to hear. Any other thoughts there? Chris. Um, it's worth thinking that <clears throat> where we know that we have to stay on a straight and narrow path going by His Word, and if we do so through our lives, we will receive persecution from other realms. That is a given. That's, that's something that we bear, but we have to do as being part of uh, in, in, in Christianity carrying on. They suffered in many ways, and but this is a small part by uh, keeping His Word the things that we would have to go through. Yeah, we, if we're committed to Him, we will be in conflict with the world around us. That is most certainly going to happen. Let's read verses 4 through 8, please. Revelation 1, 4 through 8. Who will grab that for us? Planet. 
John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay. So these seven churches of Asia, we, of course, learn a little bit more about them, the message to them in chapters 2 and 3. But if you look on a map, it's, it's a rough circle there in Asia Minor. Uh, but it's not all the churches that are located in that area. There's Troas, Colossae, Hierapolis, uh, maybe more that were in that area. Uh, but why would there be seven churches addressed here? Anybody know? Perfect number. Okay, perfect number. Which, what, what's the, what would be conveyed here? How, how would we understand that? It, it is the idea of a perfect number or? The completeness of the church. Complete. It's, yeah, you, in other words, you, you get all these churches, you look at them, and they're representative of all churches. So it may not be exactly like Smyrna or Philadelphia, but it might be a little like Smyrna and a little like Philadelphia in a congregation. And so... It, it's just there to be representative of different conditions, struggles, trials, good things, bad things that you would find within a congregation, especially in a time of trial and hardship here. But uh, just representative of the churches is the idea of these seven churches being addressed here as we've talked about the, the symbolism of the numbers in the book. Um, it's from the Father. Uh, in verse 4 and down in verse 8 really has reference to the Father. Um, the Alpha and the Omega, what does that mean? Yeah, because that's Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last, so we might say the A to Z, if you will. Um, the Father being the originator of all things and the one who is all in all in the end is first... Corinthians 15 talks about. Uh, from the seven spirits. What's that say? Maybe we'll skip on down. Right? That's a little too hard. Verses 5 to 7. Who's it from? Christ. Okay, Christ. Alright, so it says it's from the Father the one who sits on his throne, right? Who was and who is and who is to come. Uh, then from Jesus Christ. So in between that, it mentions the seven spirits. Just connect the dots. What's it say? The completeness of God is giving us this message. Okay, the completeness of God. The, it's really a reference to the Holy Spirit. It's, it's odd to us about this. To see seven spirits referring to the Holy Spirit. But again, it's just that number symbolism. He has a complete message of God to give. And so you have it from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that any different than any other place in the Bible where it talks about the process of revelation? Or as you look at the New Testament teaching about the process of revelation, how does that work? Does somebody refresh our minds? Anybody remember anything in John? I know we're going to study it, I think, this Wednesday in John 16. We'll cover it. But Jesus said, I got a message from the Father, but I'm going to send the Spirit. So the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles and prophets. That's the process of the revelation of God. And it's just laying it out for us here about this process or about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all being involved in the message that's being given to the churches. All right, anything...
down to five. There's a few things in five to seven I want to cover real quick. But All right, so it describes Jesus Christ how verse five. Wash. What's that? Wash. In verse five, Jesus Christ. In. Okay, I, yeah, I meant a little bit earlier than that. The, the faithful witness describes Him as the faithful witness. He's giving a faithful witness. Um, he, of course, was the one who revealed God to man, as, he, as we recently talked about, that Philip, he told Philip, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's a faithful witness in that sense. He's faithfully witnessing the uh, firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? See the first one resurrected from the dead? Resurrected. Stay yeah, first one resurrected and stayed that way, right? Resurrected to go on to heaven. Um, because the others, of course, in the Bible who were resurrected, at some point they died after they were resurrected. And here it's just simply saying, firstborn from the dead, the firstborn to rise from the dead and to live forever. So, Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of what? Kings of the earth. What does that speak to? He has all authority, all power of the heaven. King of Kings is one of his titles. He's the King of Kings. Exactly. Now, why might that pique the interest of those receiving the letter? Because they're <laughs> up against that power, world power, actually, at that time. So. That would have given them more courage against the Roman government, I guess. Yes. He's, he's, it's being stated right here at the very beginning. He's the ruler over the kings of the earth. There is a Caesar sitting on a throne. There are lesser rulers in various places and making your life very difficult. But understand, the one who's over all of them, the one who has authority and power over all of them is Jesus Christ, the one to whom you have pledged your life, your allegiance. All right, so it says He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And what has He done with us? Verse 6. Made, made us kings and priests. Or as in the... ASV actually a kingdom of priests. Yes, made us a kingdom priest. And you know, First Peter chapter two talks about that, that we're a royal priesthood. We're kings and priests, we're royalty, and we're uh, priests before God. Um, just speaking to that individual relationship between us and God and the ability to go to God ourselves. Um, so he says, made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Verse 7. People look at that and what? where might their mind go to immediately? Okay, maybe they'll look up and he's coming in the clouds. But what? It, it leans towards the idea that he's coming back. Okay. That's what some of the pretty ones could believe. Yes. 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 All right, so when you read it, we, we mentioned in our introductory lesson last week that it's helpful to know Old Testament symbolism and language and things that have already been revealed and when we look at those we know they're already in the past right so for instance let's go to Isaiah 19 Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 1 Isaiah 19 1 who will read that for us I'll read. Go ahead. Isaiah 19, verse 1. Yes. According to Egypt, behold, the Lord rides on the swift cloud and will come 
into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will hover at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in his midst. Okay. Well, what's he talking about? He, just reading verse 1, you get an idea of what is happening. What's another way for us to describe that? A judgment against Egypt. Exactly. Yes, judgment against Egypt by God, but how is it described? How's he coming? Yeah, he's coming on a swift cloud, right? So it's using that language in, in Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus is talking about destruction of Jerusalem. He's talking about coming in a cloud, right? So that, that language for somebody who's familiar with the New Testament and with the Old Testament, they would think judgment. There's judgment. Now the question is exactly what judgment might that be? Well, in this book, there are two judgments talked about. There's a judgment against Rome, and there's also the final judgment toward the end of the book that is brought up. But when you read here about him coming in the clouds, it doesn't automatically mean the final judgment. And a lot of our friends and neighbors think of final judgment. Every time they see something like that, they think final judgment, the Lord's return, the earth, and everything else that they have in their theory. Even when they pick up out of the Old Testament, they try to make all of that. Final yes. Judgment. Yes, that is true. That is exactly true. Right, right. Now, I would lean toward this one being referenced to the judgment of Rome, although there are others who would say, you know, this is maybe the final judgment. But be that as it may, I just want us to understand, when you read about him coming in the clouds, that really is just a general reference to judgment. And you have to look at the context as to what he's referring to, how that would specifically apply but be that as it may, he says he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, who was, or who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So this message is coming from the Almighty God to his people that are dedicated to him. Let's read now verses 9 through 11, please. Who will grab 9 through 11? Go ahead. Jesse. Hi, John. Both your brother and companion in the tribu tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am, not, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what, you, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. All right. So question number three I had asked, how does John identify with Christians in the seven churches? So he mentions verse four, or I've got there verse four, verse five, and then verse nine in particular here. So how does he identify with them? Okay, brother, which would mean what? I'm in the same family as you. And how, how did they become brothers in Christ? That he mentioned back up in verses 4 and 5. Paul referenced this a while ago. Been washed in the blood. They, they have, they're a part of the same cause, the same commitment, the same family. What else does he say? Partner in the tribulation. So he's, he's experiencing the persecution as they would. Okay, um, the apostles, what, what kind of people were they? You could say normal. You could say normal. Yeah. You must say normal. <laughs> right? We, I, I think sometimes we get this idea whether it's apostles or prophets or, or like Abraham. Well, they had this special quality or characteristic about them that gave them these superpowers of faith. And they did, you know, James describes Elijah as a man of the like nature, like passions like us. He, just like us. Normal people who committed themselves to the cause. And John is identifying and re-emphasizing that to them here. Look, I'm in 
the same situation you are, Clint. We know that the Pharisees identified uh, some of the apostles as common Galileans. How do you, how do you know? So? How are you educated? You come from this region that's not known for intelligence. Mm -hmm. Right. The fisherman, tax collector. Um, there's a rebellion zealot in there. You know, there's some what you would call weirdos. Yeah, they're they're the fringe of the leading society. They're they're out there, away from those that you would expect to be making an impact in Israel. But they were. And here, John's just simply saying, "I, I'm your brother. We're tied by blood, by the blood of Christ. That's that's our common bond. I am a companion in this tribulation, going through it. By the way, what does tribulation mean?" There's troubles, yeah. It literally is pressing, as in grapes, you know, they press the grapes, or grinding, as in grinding the wheat. What good is wheat if you don't grind it? See, there's the value in the grinding of the wheat. Is there a value in the grinding of Christians? Yeah, there's a value there. That's how our true value comes in. Are we of any value if we are untested? Not really. Where does your commitment lie? Right? We're, we're given trials, tribulations, hardships for us to be stronger, for us to show our faith in the Lord in doing His will. Any other thoughts? Clint and then Paul and Nancy. The same type of analogy is used in the New Testament where we're purified by fire. So we have to be rid of the impurities and, and, and many times we don't get rid of those impurities until we're tested, until we have to come to a fork in the road and we have to choose righteousness. Exactly. Paul? Those that he loved in case Yes. And you have to purify. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, in the process of gold, when you find it in its raw form, it has value, but it's not usable. Mm -hmm. Only after it has been processed is it usable. Exactly. Exactly right. And it's even more valuable in the hands of a master who creates something out of that. So, very good. All right, so... He says, I am your companion in the tribulation through this pressing, through this grinding, and in the kingdom. Uh, the idea of being a part of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ and in the patience of Jesus Christ. Where was he located at this time? Yeah, the island of Patmos. Um, and he states specifically for the word of God and for the testimony of of Jesus Christ. So in other words, because I have committed my life to Christ and declaring His truth, this is why I'm here. I came up against that imperial power. I came up against the enemies of the Lord and this is what they've done to me. They've sent me over here to Patmos. He's exiled there. Um, there's probably within this as well the idea of Him refusing emperor worship for the testimony of Christ. I wouldn't give up saying that Christ is Lord and He's the only Lord. Alright, now then, He received a message as it says there in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What would it be, the idea of being in the Spirit? Yes, it's just another way to describe that. He, he, his. I, I don't know if you'd say his consciousness was elevated or exactly how we might put it, but it's this idea. It's right. just, you, we we try to understand how the Holy Spirit revealed things to the apostles, mm -hmm. and 
this is about the easiest way to make that known. I mean, because we can't comprehend it beyond just imagining it, imagining a dream, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's what I believe it's talking about here. It was in the spirits of the Holy Spirit that you're willing to influence. Right. Paul, you know, he talks about that he was taken up to the third heaven. There's mm -hmm. things that he saw. He had an abundance of revelations and things like that. And uh, John's just describing here that he was in this state or this condition. And, of course, he sees these signs and symbols go before him. And he hears these things that are going on. And he writes that revelation down. But he says he's in the spirit of the Lord's day. What day is that? Okay. If you read, starting in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, and you get to Revelation chapter 1, and you read the Lord's Day, there is no other day that you can think of other than the first day. And why would that be? Acts 20, verse 7, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1, where it talks about commandments, and this is what you do on this day. There's no other day of the week that we're commanded to do anything except for the first day. And so there's that equivalency. Uh, um, this is when you worship. This is when you complete commandments that are outlined in, in, in the pattern of the New Testament. And what's even foundational to those in the biblical record? Resurrection. Resurrection on the first day of the week. And what else? Genesis. Well, there's a first day of creation that's mentioned, but in the New Testament, when was the church established? Yeah, church was established on the first day of the week, on Sunday. So you have the resurrection, you have the kingdom being established in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, that meant it was Sunday morning when those events unfolded. You have the saints assembling regularly Acts 20 verse 7 on the first day of the week you have Paul saying when you come together on the first day of the week and that implies there was a regular habit of them coming together on the first day and you get here and he talks about you know I was in the spirit of the Lord's day your, your mind would just go okay he's talking about on Sunday that's when he's receiving this vision this revelation if you will um, so he's told to write what he sees, and that message is going to be carried out then to the seven churches of Asia. Anything else through verse 11? All right. Let's read verses 12 through 16, please. 12 to 16, who will grab that for us? Chris. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst, of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about his chest a golden band. His head and hair were like his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as it was fine in a furnace. And his voice, as, excuse me, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Okay, so here's where we really begin to get into the symbolism, the signification, if you will, of the message that's being given. He's giving us a, a glimpse here of kind of what we're going to see going forward in the letter. And he just makes mention of, you know, here's these golden lampstands and there's one among them like the Son of Man. Now that's a direct reference, obviously, to Christ. There, there's, 
you know, later it talks about him being a lamb. Okay, so that's symbolism, but here there's a direct reference, son of man. But it's kind of helping us, okay, then he describes him and gives all these different things that we'll talk about in just a minute. But it, it's beginning to give us that symbolism. And I want us to know that as we look at this, it's helping us to see we can understand what he's talking about. Now, are there some challenges? Are there some difficulties in different places in the book? Yes. But the basic message of the book, we can get, we can understand that. Just like we can understand him talking about the Son of Man and the different ways or the different qualities or characteristics that are revealed here. But be that as it may, he talks about he saw seven golden lampstands. Um, when you get down a little bit later, you understand that these are individual lampstands. But in the Old Testament, what was the lampstand, if you will? What was it like? Does anybody remember? Old Testament, temple, tabernacle? Okay, one base and seven then candlesticks attached to that one base. They call it the menorah, I believe. Um, but here you have seven individual ones. It helps us in part to see that this is talking about congregations that stood on their own. They were not dependent on each other. That's just a basic principle that goes throughout the New Testament that congregations are independent, they're autonomous. That's being given here even in this vision, this symbolism that's being laid out before us. And it says that in the midst of the seven lampstands, each one of these is the Son of Man. Anything we can learn from that? It's Christ is with us in the church. In this. Okay. Kind of the thought that comes to mind. Okay. Yeah. They're his. They are his. That's for sure. Clint. Uh, the ESV, uh, in, in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, kind of seems like he's the one who's managing it. Or going back to Ephesians, he's, he's the head of the church. Mm -hmm. right? He's the one who is the connection between any of these churches is, is him. Christ. Mm -hmm. Are we, I just, I want to be very precise in this. Are we talking here about the universal church? Is that the symbolism in the, what's being described? It's about the seven churches. It's the seven churches. It's it's talking about the individual local congregations. He's there in the vision walking among them because later it says, you know, in verse uh, 20, that the uh, seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches, talking about the seven churches of Asia. But he's walking among them. It, it's the idea, kind of what Clint was pointing out, he's, he's among them, managing or overseeing them that he is there and aware of exactly what they're going through. He knows their condition because he's walking among them. He sees struggles and weaknesses as well as strengths. Um, what does that say? Maybe I should phrase it a different way. Is it any different today? So if we said the seven churches of North Carolina, which there may, are there seven? <laughs> so, yeah. So he, he's walking among his people today. Do you ever think about that? you ever think about the Lord is walking among his people on the Lord's day? He is here with us, walking among us. As we assemble, as his people, you know, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. 
But here he's talking about he's he's among them. He knows what's he knows the condition of Newton. He knows what's good about us. He knows what's bad about us. He knows where we struggle. He knows what we're facing. He knows what's around the corner that we may not be able to see. He knows that. Let me ask you something now. When you think about that, does that have any bearing on the importance of a local church? Maybe the need to be a part of a local church. Where the Lord's walking among them and He's dealing with them and He's sending messages to them and He talks about those who are among them. When we get into chapter 2 and chapter 3, He'll talk about, you know, there, there are some who have kept yourselves clean. The Lord is very cognizant of local congregations. It's His intent for His people to come together as a local group to work and worship and serve and be effective in carrying out His will in this world. That's His intent. Here, we have a beautiful picture of that as He's walking among these churches. Any other thoughts? I know there are a few hands a little bit ago. Huh? As you are saying, Steve, He's cognizant of a local church. Therefore, we are not insignificant to God, to Christ. We carry great significance just as He will reveal to us the understanding of the seven churches, as you previously mentioned, He understands us as well. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up because the Lord's attention, His love, His care, His concern is primarily on His people. We, we are if you will, the center of His universe. Now, He loves all men. He wants all men to come to Him, but we share a special relationship with the Lord that other people don't share. And He is looking out among us and has that relationship with us. There was another hand over here. Was Paul? Well, as a local church, we can... I don't know really how to explain it, but those in need... In the congregation, we'd be more aware of local congregation instead of. Uh, uh, like I, I don't, I don't really have a relationship with people in Asheville. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That as a local congregation here, we get to know each other. We know each other's trials, struggles, needs. Yes. Yeah, and we're here to encourage. One another, as Hebrews chapter 10 talks about, we, we provoke one another to love and good works. And that, uh, a key part of that is our assembling together to be able to do it as we are doing right now. Now, question number four I ask you to list the descriptions ascribed to the Lord in verses 13 to 16. Let's give a brief definition or explanation. Let, let's touch on some of these here. So, what about the garment to the feet and the golden chest band? Anybody have anything on that? Uh, that? That would have been the, um, the high priest clothing. Right. There, there is that imagery of high priest or in Eastern culture, a high-ranking official, but we think of high priest and priesthood there. Um, what about the hair being white? Purity. Purity holiness. Uh, eyes of fire. What's that? There's illuminating and there's something else in there. Penetrating. Penetrating. Right. Those eyes of fire that are penetrating and seeing all. Uh, feet of brass. Anybody ever have a brass paperweight? Something like that? Solid. So that feet of brass could be the idea of he stands firmly but also can crush. Right? Very, a lot of power behind that. A uh, voice like many waters. Uh, soothing. Could be soothing. Peaceful, peaceful voice. Or, I mean, it could be... Think of Niagara Falls. Yeah, it could be powerful. Too, so. Power. Yeah, overwhelming. In fact, when John 
when John hears this, verse 17 says, he does what? He fell dead. Saw him and fell dead at his feet. You know, this he has a voice of many waters, powerful, awe-inspiring. Um, out of his mouth was what? Sword. 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 Is there any way to misunderstand that? Joe. Hey, Joe. Um, yeah, the Word of God. And sword of judgment, or word of judgment that's coming out. Countenance like the sun being the light of the world, seeing His majesty there. All right, let's read 17 to 20. And we'll go ahead, Nancy. Could I bring up one other, yes. one other thing, which was Son of Man, which it also represents His humanity in with all of He relates with Him. He... He went through plenty of suffering, right? And paid the ultimate price. And that's what he's asking them to do. All right, 17 to 20. Let's read that, please. Before we move on, side note. Um, in Daniel 10, he runs, in, he runs into someone who has an almost exact... He describes him almost the exact same way and he has the same reaction as John does, basically. Overwhelming, awe-inspiring. Very good. Let's read 17 to 20, please. Go ahead, Elijah. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars of the seven angels, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay. Alright, so John is overwhelmed here, but what does the Lord do? God him, him not be afraid. Yeah, lays his right hand on him. Don't be afraid. So there's comforting, there's reassurance that is being given to him here. Um, question number five I'd ask, what does it mean that he has the keys of Hades and death? Power over what okay. What is Hades? Hades is the realm of the dead. Realm of the dead. So what's he saying here? He's overcome death. Do I? He's overcome death. He has power over death. Where does everyone go when they die? Hades. What's he saying here? That the power to unlock that door to bring you out. So. No, in the in the later in the book we'll find out that Hades is. Yeah, Hades is going to be thrown into the lake of fire, but that is here. If you end up in Hades, not a problem. I got power over it. I'll bring you out of it. Clint. Another idea that you get is, is as a key holder, then you're authorized with that door. You can open it or close it and lock it and keep someone in at will because you're authorized to have it. Just like we have keys to this building. You have a key, then you're authorized to be here and come inside and clean and do whatever you need to do, then lock it back up so nobody else can get in. Um, but this is also, I think, a, a direct contrast to what they're feeling as far as power goes. The Roman government has power over them, they're persecuting them, they're physically hurting them. And this is a contrast with what we just saw with the, the hair is wool, the fire eyes, the sword. Brass, it's all. I have the power. Mm -hmm. I have dominion over even Hades, which you may not even understand. Mm -hmm. And so you think that the Roman government has power, it has nothing compared to what I have. Right, right, good point. So, Nancy? Uh, well, because he refers to two, Hades and death, it made me think body and soul. Yes. Yes, he's going to bring them out of Hades, the body, bodily resurrection, change in the twinkling of an eye. Yes, exactly right. So, 
He's told to write these things down, the things that he's already seen, the things that he's going to see that will be revealed throughout the book. I just want to touch very briefly here. The, in verse 20, he essentially explains the symbolism. And in places throughout the book, there will be some footnotes or explanations of the symbolism. So it's not all you know, just un, completely unknown, if you will. But he talks about that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. How else can angel be translated? messenger okay John's referred to as a messenger in Mark chapter 1 uh, John the baptizer sent messengers to Jesus to ask questions of him and it's that same word that's translated here angels and I, while I wouldn't debate you on whether or not there was an angelic being that kind of had you know the duty to watch over each church I would lean toward there's a messenger of these churches, someone who is to take this message to them, um, as opposed to an angelic being delivering that to them. So, you know, like chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. I would see that a little bit more as to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. Give that message, send it on. But be that as it may. Um, we're out of time. Thank you all very much, Lord willing. Chapters 2 and 3 next week, and we're going to go like lightning through that. Be, be ready.